So now we move to the last talk of the day. So um, it's more about open publishing. And um, so it fits very well with the open science um, approach. And uh, HRB is quite proud. Uh, we are the first in Ireland to launch it. And we follow a few other organizations. A welcome has been the, been the first. Uh, has been the Bill uh, Gates Foundation. Is there anything else? Anyone else? Okay, and I think the European Commission will be probably moving towards uh, an open publishing platform as well soon. So HRB has been working with Holly. Holly is the um, uh, so it's part of the policy team in F1000, and uh, so F1000 is definitely leading the way in that um, open publishing. And uh, she's been working with HRB for. Some months, yes. So we launch end of October for Open Access Week, and she's going to tell you everything about HRB Open Research. Okay. Yes, so my name's Holly. I work as part of the strategy team at F1000, and right now my focus is on the HRB Open Research Publishing Platform, which is due to launch in the first quarter of 2018. Uh, for those of you who aren't quite familiar with HRB Open Research, it's a publishing platform where HRB-funded researchers can publish any research they feel that's worth sharing in an open way. And this includes traditional research articles, as well as less traditional ones like study protocols, uh, null or negative results, as well as data papers, amongst many others. And in order to understand why the HRB has established this platform, it really helps to understand the current culture surrounding research dissemination. Uh, publications are an important part of scientific research, as was raised already this morning. Uh, they promote the dissemination of results, and which, in an ideal world, it leads to the progress of science by the application of discoveries, reuse of findings, and the replication of research. Uh, publications have also become the currency by which researchers are evaluated. The limitation is that the current mechanisms for recruitment, career progression, and access to research funding are often based on the journal in which a paper is published rather than the intrinsic value of the research itself. Uh, and this is further complicated by the fact that time from submission of a paper to its actual publication is typically on the scale of months or even years and is often accompanied by both publication and editorial bias, which plays into research waste and what's been coined the reproducibility crisis. And when we think of these limitations in terms of health research and the work that you are all doing, um, the stakes are extremely high. A failure to publicly disclose all results, including the underlying data, in a timely manner could very well expose patients to unnecessary research, engender misinformation, and skew priorities in health research. Um, but there is some good news. Much like science is self-correcting, we are actually seeing a shift in this culture. Uh, leaders, uh, such as funders, the Wellcome Trust, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, have emerged, and they're using open access and open data policies to really drive this change. They're also taking advantage of new innovations, such as these open research publishing platforms. Uh, and the HRB is really no exception here. Um, Recently, the HRB has signed the DORA Agreement, which is a pledge to end the use of the journal impact factor when evaluating researchers, research groups, or even institutions. The HRB also has a very strong open access policy, and just recently, the HRB has joined uh, the likes of the Wellcome Trust and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in launching this open research publishing platform. And so this platform was really designed to help the HRB and their grantees explore the benefits of open, open publishing. And these benefits include increasing the speed of dissemination, introducing transparency into the peer review process, supporting reproducibility, and moving away from tainted uh, metrics such as the impact factor. Uh, to this end, HRB Open Research uses a fairly unique open post-publication peer review system combined with an open data policy. And this uh, model was originally developed and designed on our own brand platform, F1000 Research. Uh, and it, it was designed to address some of the pain points associated with traditional publishing, namely delays, editorial bias, and waste. And it looks a little something like this. And what it means that 
When an article or piece is submitted, we do a quick internal hygiene check. We don't have editors who are judging the paper based on impact or novelty, but instead we're checking that the article meets the standards demanded by the community. We're asking questions like, for a medical article, does it have the ethical approval required? We're checking to ensure that the article uh, adheres to any applicable reporting guidelines, such as the care guidelines for case reports, consort guidelines for clinical trials, and most importantly, we're checking to see whether the data underlying the results has been made available. Avoiding delay, we then publish the article immediately, and this publication is actually what triggers the peer review process. Uh, peer review at HRB Open Research is open and transparent. Peer review reports are published alongside the articles, and the peer reviewers' names and affiliations are listed. Authors then have the opportunity to respond to any criticisms raised, raised by the peer reviewers and publish a revised version of their article. And in this way, we create a sort of continuous publication process. And because nothing is ever removed, it means that as readers, you can see the full history of an article, as well as the whole conversation between the peer reviewers and the authors. And to really illustrate this process, because HRB Open Research actually won't publish its first articles uh, into next year, I thought we could spend the next few minutes talking about uh, a similar initiative, Welcome Open Research, which was launched by the Welcome Trust uh, just one year ago. And this uh, Welcome Open Research uses the same model that will be used on HRB Open Research. And what you're looking at here is a study protocol published by Rebecca Slater and colleagues on Welcome Open Research. And the real meat of this slide is in the peer review box uh, on the right-hand side. And as I mentioned, you can see that the peer reviewers' names and affiliations are listed. We also ask that peer reviewers assign a status to the article when they've completed peer review. Uh, they have three statuses from which they can choose. The first status is symbolized by the green check mark, of which you can see two here. Uh, and this is the approved status. And this means that the peer reviewers found the article to be scientifically sound and are happy with it in its current format. The second status from which peer reviewers can choose is symbolized by the green question mark, the one you can see here, and that is approved with reservations. And this is reserved for papers where peer reviewers have found some flaws, but they feel that these flaws could be addressed by the authors in revising the article and publishing a new version. The last status which is available and not shown here is the not approved status, and this is symbolized suitably by a big red X. Uh, and this is reserved for papers where the peer reviewers have found fundamental flaws in the work that seriously undermine the results or con conclusions. The peer review status for readers is also uh, clearly labeled in the title, as you can see here, so that when you're actually browsing the page, you know exactly where it's at in the peer review process. In addition to choosing a status, we also ask that the peer reviewers provide a detailed report summarizing the status they selected and why they selected it. And this report is published at the bottom of the paper uh, so that both the authors and readers can see it. Uh, authors then have a chance to respond to the referees and they can do so uh, by revising the paper. And when they do so, we also ask that they submit a summary of the changes that have been made in the revised paper so that it's clear both to peer reviewers and readers what exactly has been changed from the first version to the next. Each article on Welcome Open Research is also accompanied by article-level metrics. In addition to view and download counts, we also use alternative metrics, and these include things like how many times the paper has been mentioned on social media. And as you can see, now that this paper is starting to get a little older, it has two citations as well from papers in PubMed. And if we move away from the article level, level metrics and look at Welcome Open Research as a whole, in its first year, we found that Welcome Open Research was the fifth most popular title by volume amongst Welcome-funded researchers. And so this really gives us something to aim for with HRB Open Research to see if we can do as well, if not better. And if we delve a bit deeper into those numbers, Welcome Open Research published 142 articles this year, and there was 166 data sets linked to these articles in our recommended repositories. Um, perhaps the most impressive speed thus far, though, is 
the most impressive aspect thus far is the speed. Uh, the mean time from, the to, from submission to publication of the first referee report and second referee report were 14 days and 25 days res respectively. And this is extremely quick when you compare it to the traditional peer review system. And so if we go back to thinking about HRB open research, it begs an important question. Why should HRB uh, funded researchers publish here? Uh, immediately, immediate publication means your results can be shared without delay. HRB Open Research will also publish a variety of article types, meaning that we can publish all your research outputs. So there's no reason for things to be relegated to a, a hard drive or worse, a waste bin. Uh, you'll be happy to know that HRB Open Research also fulfills HRB's open access requirements. Um, publication of the underlying data also facilitates the reanalysis, reuse, and replication, which improves research reproducibility. Uh, we also open up what typically takes place behind closed doors. Authors, not editors, are choosing when and what they want to publish, and the peer review is open and transparent, meaning that you also give credit to peer reviewers. And lastly, publishing on HRB Open Research is easy, as the costs are directly covered by the HRB. And since we've been talking about fairness today, I thought we should t touch on this as well. It's important to, to mention that HRB Open Research itself is not a data publisher. But while we're not a data publisher, we uh, will actually support the FAIR principles uh, using our data policy, and more specifically, by our recommendations for data repositories and their requirements, as well as our best practices for authors. Uh, in order to host data linked to an HRB re research article, we require that repositories assign a globally unique persistent identifier, and where it is safe to do so, that the data sets be completely open. We also require that repositories hosting data linked to HRB open research articles provide appropriate metadata about the data set in both human readable and machine readable forms, such as the data site metadata schema. And this data must be accessible for both search and retrieval. And to increase both accessibility and reusability, we also ask that authors adhere to some best practices when they're preparing their data for deposition in a data repository. An example of this includes that we request that authors use non-proprietary file formats, such as CSV files in place of Excel files. And with that, I'd like to ask you to join the momentum. Uh, we heard a lot today about fair data and, and how this will, you know, in the next five years is certainly going to become a bigger thing. And I think equally that open science publishing is really gaining some traction as well. Specifically, both the HRB and the EU Commission recognize and endorse open science. And so with that, uh, if you have a, a piece of work in mind that you think is suitable for HRB Open Research, or you'd just like to read the first batch of papers, the submission system opens towards the end of January uh, with the official launch uh, in the first quarter of 2018. And I'll be at the reception. If you have any questions, feel free to pull me aside. And you can also email info at hrbopenresearch.org at any time. And I think we have some time for questions now as well. So I think you may have mentioned it, maybe I missed it, but so the the journal is going to be indexed and so people can find uh, studies to put through PubMed and so on, is that right? Uh, yes, our plan is to be indexed in PubMed, but with PubMed you actually need to have 25 articles published before you can make an application for indexing. So welcome Open Research, it took us about eight months to go through that process. So okay. it really depends on... And do you know how uh, Google Scholar works and how they'll pick We're us? indexed straight away in Google You're indexed Scholar. straight away, yeah. okay, thanks exactly. very much. And I believe they do a 24-hour turnaround on scraping the data. Yeah. Thanks. It's using the same publishing model, but it's a separate system. So it's not that you're accessing F1000 to publish it now? No, no, it'll have its own login, separate login. But it is F1000 staff, so the editorial staff behind it is F1000 staff that's driving it. 
And in terms of, you said the HRB would cover the cost, is that factored into a grant or post publication? Uh, that's on our Sorry. side, yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, we went through an open uh, competitive public procurement procedure for this, so we laid out the model that we wanted to follow and left it open for people to apply. Um, we like the model that F1000 have um, and we see how it works elsewhere, so um, we're, we're delighted that we were able to appoint them in the end. Um, we're trying to make it easy for researchers and to support, I mean part of this is to learn, it's a, a pilot at this stage, so we actually want to learn as a funder how we actually can support open research um, and then support the researchers themselves to do this. So we've made it easy by covering the APC costs centrally. So the researchers who publish here won't be charged. That charge will come back to the HRB. Um, and it is part of our public procurement costs. Um, so, and I would say that the costs for APCs, traditionally we don't cover, blanket cover APCs, but um, for this we are covering it and the APCs are very competitive compared to the normal journal standards. Um, and all of the costs and everything that's been done with HRB Open Research, there's an extensive list of FAQs um, that uh, we've been through um, and it'll tell you exactly you know, how much things are costing us, what we're paying for, what we're doing, what F1000 <coughs> are doing um, and the tender documents even there as well. Uh, this is a it's a HRB platform, not a national platform. So it is researchers who've been funded, or co-funded, by the HRB. So things like our research leaders programs, we will cover because they're uh, we're funding the person there. We will cover anything that's funded by those by anybody who has held a grant from the HRB from the first of January two thousand and seventeen onwards. So if you had an active grant in those days, we will fund your research publications. And we also, <laughs> if it's linked, yeah, no, no, God, if it's linked to, I don't know what the exact wording, uh, Teresa. Um, no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so anyone who's held an active grant as or from the 1st of January 2017, and that's, if that, I, yeah, as you can hear me rather than shouting. Um, so that's whether you're co-funded or if you're, for example, employed at one of the CRFs or if you're working through anything that's funded through the HRB. So it'll be your name, obviously, on the paper and you were working on something that's HRB funded. So it wouldn't be that something that's completely not linked to anything that we funded you for. Obviously, there's a, you know, a limit, but we're encouraging anybody who's anyway linked to the HRB to use the platform. Yeah, that's fine. Exactly. But you are eligible. You're eligible to apply. You are. Uh, again, I th a bit like this morning with the fur principles, I think this is a really laudable initiative and I quite like the idea that the HRB are going to move away from the assessment of journal impact factors um, as the only criteria possibly for indicating how good someone's research actually is. Um, the question I have for you is that universities haven't subscribed to moving away from journal impact factors as a criteria for uh, promotion within universities. And uh, one of your colleagues came to present to us at the, Ar the Irish Longitudinal Study of Aging and, and we spoke to him about some of the reservations that we had and some of the enthusiasm we had for, for the system. And what we were trying to get the sense of was, were in the packing order, for example, with the Welcome um, Trust Open Online uh, Publishing, how far down the list was the Welcome Trust publication, so did they go to all of the big journals first, and if they got refusals, <laughs> then it became welcome trust, or, or was this the first protocol for people when they were publishing their papers, because I think it was, was about 12 uh, papers per month, mm -hmm. which for the UK, to me, doesn't seem like a particularly large mm -hmm. publication based on the first year of operation. Yeah, well, 
I think to answer that, it's really a mixed bag. So, I mean, to say that we don't have people that have shopped around and come to us is a lie. There are lots of things that can't get published in big journals that do find their home in, in welcome open research. On the same token, we've, we've had some quite prominent researchers who are at a place in the, their career where they can publish in welcome open research without worrying about the impact factor and, and their assessment within their universities. Uh, Equal to that, we have had young researchers as well, and in that sense, it very much works as a complement to the traditional publishing system. Uh, so we always sort of joke that, you know, we don't expect you to give us your Lancet article, we'd love it, but there's a lot of stuff that isn't going to get into the Lancet, and a lot of stuff that doesn't have a home in any journals. If you think about software tools, uh, study protocols can be particularly difficult to publish. So in that sense, uh, for younger researchers, we really view it as a complement, as something extra they can put in that application when they are being assessed by the universities. about impact factor. Um, generally, HRB has not been too much linked to impact factor, and we are trying to, especially now with officially signing to DORA, we are trying to look beyond um, just impact factor citation, is trying to look more at what impact the research is making in terms of contribution. Um, it's not easy, it's more qualitative assessment, and I know you, you were part of the emerging investigators, so there was more work. So I know there is sometimes some complaints by investigators, like there is more work in the application, but we are trying to look at other ways we can, especially because HRB found quite a lot in trying to influence policy and practice is not necessary all peer review publications we're trying to open up and we accept have been been more explicit as well in citation or open data and other type of dissemination that is not just publications. No, it's the impactful is more on the knowledge advancement and contribution. It's the impact then is very, is sometimes it's about the definition, but yeah, we're trying to change. And regarding the institutions, um, yes, that's a big, it's a big change that will take time, I think. So we recently had um, Dr. Conor O'Carroll, who has been chairing two of the working group of the Open Science Policy Platform. One is on skills and education, and the other one is about reward and, um, and is about all the skills, all individuals, not just PhD students, but even leaders and professors need to learn about the new open science uh, practices. But as well, on the other side, yes, there is a way funders can push some of this open science, but there is the other side in which the researcher needs to be recipient, but the institution needs to change and will take time. It's, it's, a, it's a big cultural shift, uh, and that's the reason we are here just openly discussing. But yes, from the institution perspective, just to not look at the impact factor, um, it's a big cultural shift, yeah, will be eventually. I feel like I have to say this at the end of everything, but the commissioner <laughs> are going to bring out a report next, early next year, um, which will look at all of the open science policy platforms, working groups, including the skills, rewards, and recommendations that link into next generation metrics. Um, and they're actively looking at the metrics they will use for FP9 and how they will look at openness and rewards and incentives for researchers. So it is a real thing. It's not just anymore something that people sign up to a declaration and then do nothing about. Something is actually going to happen in this space. Any more questions? Time for drinks? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a bit too eager. <laughs> Exactly. It's, it's very similar to the traditional system. So we have what we call an author-led model. So we do ask when you submit your paper that 
you suggest to us five peer reviewers that you think would be suitable. Uh, we then take that and we do our own conflict of interest checks and, and expertise checks. And if we deem the peer reviewer that you suggested to be suitable, we then take care of the invitations and the actual communication. So it's not you on your own sort of emailing reviewers. We, we do that invited process on your behalf. Uh, two, so we, yeah, yeah, so we always invite three, but yeah, we'll, we'll two re peer review reports and we consider peer review complete. Both of them are, all of them are nominated by the audience? Yes, yes. So yeah, all five nominated by the authors. Uh, we also have a peer reviewer tool that basically text mines your paper and will suggest people to you as well. So in case you actually can't think of anyone or don't know anyone suitable, uh, but we do also always ask that you, you approve the suggestions. But, yeah. I'm an editor of another journal and we've been warned about rogue reviewers where the actual author um, suggests a, a, a reviewer who is a, j just has a different email address and it's actually themselves. So, so people are reviewing their own papers. Yeah, so I think, that, I, problem, yeah. I think there needs to be some scrutiny perhaps around, yes. around that issue. Uh, we actually verify emails, so we require institutional email addresses that we have an in-house team that verifies those emails. Yeah, no, because this is a real problem. But, but I suppose the other thing is that it, it could be a valid email. It could be the person who's in the office next door who's reviewing the, the thing. Course. So I suppose that may be one of my concerns about using suggested reviewers all the time. Yeah, uh, I think that's where declaration of interest and competing interests come in. I mean you're always going to have a case where you can't totally police it, uh, mm. but by making the peer reviews transparent, we think that you lessen that, uh, you know, sort of deviance. Uh, you also, it means it can be reported easier, and, and to be honest, on F1000 Research, we have had a case where it's been reported by actually a reader that says, I see the author list, I see the referee's name, and I know for a fact that you know, there's competing interests that have not been declared here. And we're able then to follow that up and actually go to the referee and say, you, know, you need to declare these competing interests. It needs to be made transparent to everyone. So, yeah. And, and I think that's consistent with what we were saying earlier about fair data, mm -hmm. um, that it's not so much the, the police that's controlling quality of data, but it's just having all this provenance that we can go back after the fact and we can check mm -hmm. all exactly. that. Yeah. In terms of using two reviewers, if they disagree, if one approves the article and the other doesn't, what happens then? I mean, I thought the norm was to use three so that there's... Uh, yeah, so we will continue the peer review process. So the peer review process only stops when the author it wants it to stop. Uh, obviously, if you have, you know, one accepted and one rejected, that's extremely rare, but let's say one approved and one approved with reservations, uh, the author then has the choice. They can revise the paper to try and get an approved from the reviewer. And, and you know meet that criteria. They can also invite more re peer reviewers. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And just to clarify, I mean the article appears straight away for yes. everyone to see. Yes. You know, so this is a this is a very different way yes. of, of re reviewing. Mm -hmm. And a scary thing as a reviewer is your name with all the comments appears in public. Yes. Not just for the for the article authors to see, but for the community to see. Mm -hmm. And if you've missed something. It's quite scary because you kind of say, that's my reputation there. So I think there's a hesitation sometimes in accepting open reviewed articles for that reason. Certainly. Is there, the, is there a facility as well for the community to comment yep. and the author to reply and revise the article? Yeah, so we have so a So it's a bit like plus, plus one kind of Exactly, we system. have a comment system um, for, for anyone in the scientific community to comment on the articles. Uh, and then authors are notified when a comment's received on their article. And we have seen a few articles um, on F1000 research where the comments have led to major revisions and cases where peer reviewers have actually missed things and people commenting have actually been able to, to point that out. And it's actually made the paper better as a whole. So even though the peer reviewer did miss something, uh, because they made their peer review open and transparent, it, it was more easy for someone to point out and, and in that way you're always improving the paper which really is the end goal of the whole system. I think it's very well conditioned. Does, does the review process keep going then? Forever? <laughs> it could, yeah. No, it could. Uh, it could. Technically, uh, we put no limitations on how many reviewers the author wants to invite. Uh, obviously, if it's 
past peer review or failed peer review, uh, we do stress to the author that you don't want to sort of wear down resources and, and you know, we can give our expertise as far as that goes, but technically you could keep inviting peer reviewers if you wanted. Whether or not they'll accept, you, you, yeah, well, exactly. But that's up to you. You can stop peer review as well, you can say. Uh, yeah, this thing of closure, I think, is important. I think we all know when something's done, we breathe a yeah. sigh of relief. But I want to know, how do we definitively cite the version of the paper? How do we get a, like a DOI that is that version of the paper, not another? How do you deal with, yes. with that? So we actually have dynamic DOIs that have version numbers attached to them. Uh, so we always say that you should cite the version you're using, very much like you know data sets as well, that if you use the paper, you should cite the paper. If you use the data set, you should cite the data set. So we're working off the same thing. Uh, we also for PubMed, we, we've come up with this sort of dynamic citation as well, where you know it really travels with the title, and it's quite clear at what stage in the peer review process the paper is. Yeah. Just somebody asked about the EU um, model. Um, there will be a tender put out by the Commission. Um, probably the beginning of January, um, but they have allocated a budget of 6.4 million to actually develop a European platform, which will follow the same approach, open peer review, open publication, uh, citable data, inviting negative papers, all of those kind of things, exact same model. Um, it's open for anybody to bid from January, if anybody wants to bid, um, and this is something that they will, they're monitoring very closely. Um, so just to urge you to actually engage with this, to look at you know, what we put up online, because all of the questions are there, and the fact that we will, we're doing this to support you, so to bring it back to the data side of things, really, that um, there are, you can publish your data sets, there are data notes online. Um, we will advise you, um, when, when I say we, F1000 as our service providers, will, if you're not sure about whether your data should be published or how it should be published, um, F1000 will advise you on how to do this. Um, so, you know, the support's there to actually help you operationalize some of the things that we were talking about this morning. Um, and just if anybody doesn't know Therese, um, she is kind of working very hard in-house on this. Okay.